He is risen. You know this story as well as I do. If you grew up in the church, we've heard it every year about this time. We're here today because of this story. We've gathered because of this story. We've sung songs of worship because of this story. There are certain songs that we look forward to every year around Easter time. And we haven't quite got to some of them yet, but we're not done yet today. If you have a Bible, turn it to John chapter 20. If you have a pew Bible, you can, it's on pages 800 and 809, 808 and 809. Today, instead of reading the whole story, we're going to highlight some of the characters in the story of John chapter 20. And we're going to notice what it is that they just missed. But I do want to read the first couple verses just to, to get us set and, and started on our way. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week... Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Mary informs the disciples, in this case, named Simon Peter, and it says the other disciple, and if you're familiar with the book of John, he never talks about himself, but in, in this case he describes himself as the other disciple and the one whom Jesus loved is John, the one who's writing this book, speaking of himself. So John and Peter run to the tomb after Mary tells them this, and we know from the rest of the story that Peter goes in, uh, John, in a somewhat unhumble way, says he got there first, he was a faster runner, but he stands outside and Peter goes on in and sees the grave clothes laying there. And now let's look at the rest of Mary's story. Skip down to verse 11. We, we've come across here in verse 2 a common theme of all the message of this series leading up to Easter. Mary Magdalene says, we do not know where they have laid him. Once again, someone doesn't understand what has happened, what's going on. And I don't blame Mary at this point. But let's look at the rest of the story, verse 11. So Mary stands weeping outside the tomb in verse 11. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Just miss what an opportunity to be the first one to recognize Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Now I can't say that I blame her, given the emotional situation, the toll that has taken place over the last several days, that as Mary goes there and all of a sudden there's an empty tomb which she was not expecting, none of the disciples were, they didn't under, and John's going to tell us, they didn't understand any of this at the time, but Mary's in this hour before the sun comes up, it says it's still dark, she goes there, the tomb is empty, she says, I don't know what's happened, goes to get Peter and John, they come and find it out and they just leave. John still is telling us Mary's part of the story. She's confused. And you know the story, she thinks it's the gardener. She's missing out on the excitement that has just taken place. The risen Savior, she's going about her task, she's trying to in her brain process what is going on here? So there's her brain thinking, I need to get this figured out, and her emotions thinking, they've taken away, and this is what she says, they have taken my Savior, taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. There's both emotion and practicality in that. She just misses being able to say, I was the first to see him. But John lets us know that she was. John saves that for us, and we probably should note here that this is a very significant thing that John would leave Mary in this story. Let's go to verse 15. Jesus said to, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Same thing the angels asked. Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. I've got a handle on this now. If you took him, let me know what happened, and I'll have this thing sorted out in my mind, and we can go from there. Verse 16, and I would have loved to hear the tone of his voice. Jesus said to her, Mary? Like, he's got to be, Mary, it's me. I'm standing right in front of you. That's got to be the tone in his voice. And in that moment, she turns and says to him here in verse 16, in Aramaic, Rabboni. 
which means teacher. When she hears his voice, she knows who it is. But now she's gone on a whole new thing. But you were dead a couple days ago. And she must have grabbed him in that moment. Jesus said to her, verse 17, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. What is Mary's response in verse 18? Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples. I wish I looked up that word announced to what it really means there. I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. There's really no need for this part of the story. John could tell the story that when John and the other disciple heard about the tomb, they ran to see if it was true. It is significant that he preserves Mary here. Actually, if you read all four Gospels, it's women that are the first to arrive at the tomb in every Gospel. Which is remarkable for the time because you've, you've heard the stories told of that women were not allowed to testify in court as witnesses. Their testimony wasn't credible enough. They were almost second class citizens. Yet in the scriptures, in the gospel, we see that women are the first ones there. And it's preserved by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all tell us that it was the woman that was the first to know about the empty tomb. You probably wouldn't know this about Scripture, but some people would read Scripture and say, well, women are second-class citizens. You know, men marry multiple wives and all those sorts of things. What you have to understand is that in Scripture, every time a woman is addressed or spoken or mentioned, she is elevated in the culture in which they're placed. When Jesus talks to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, he's doing something that would have been unheard of. Women are constantly given a higher status in the stories of Scripture than would have been normal in that culture. We would think if John's going to write this, if the gospel writers are going to write it, they're going to leave the women out because it's not important. But that's not what happens, is it, ladies? You're the first one there. I saw a, a Facebook quote or tweet yesterday that if it wasn't for women, we wouldn't know about the resurrection. <laughs> Which there's some truth to that. I think eventually Jesus would have announced himself somehow. But it is significant. We can't miss that point. The reality is that scripture elevates women in the culture in which they live and they, they serve a greater role than was common. And the first person that Jesus speaks to when he comes out is Mary. But in this story, we know that Mary wasn't the only one to have just missed the opportunity to recognize. John recognizes it later, but she just missed it in the moment. Look at verse 19. There's another group of people that have just missed what's happening, the significance now time, some time passes. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, so Mary's there before dawn. Now it's the evening of that day. The door's being locked where the disciples were. Just missing the point. I was a little taken 
back to you when I heard a story, I don't know if you're a basketball fan or not, but there was a basketball person that we're almost done with. And there was a, there is, well, it was a Christian university playing the NCAA March Madness basketball tournament. And they had standards about certain things, lying, cheating, stealing, drinking, same-sex marriage, all those sorts of things. And in the USA Today, you know, a reporter took the opportunity to say that they should not be allowed to play this tournament because they're against social social and just making a long list. In the USA Today, should be allowed in because of their stances on things like, especially homosexuality, I think was an issue. But that wasn't the part that surprised me that an article would be written. I heard at least two Christian leaders or writers pointing out that this article had been written and warning Christians that this was happening. That's what surprised me. The surprising part to me is that we should be surprised that the article was written. Or we should be worried or fearful that someone in the world didn't like because someone took a stand for Jesus. This is the way the world responds when people follow Jesus. We are missing it on occasions because we're just like the second one, afraid of what the world thinks of us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, They will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Then he says, This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Oh, on Easter, the disciples have an opportunity to bear witness, and they go, Well, not my doors. They were not going to do it. What a challenge that we can't blame them because we do the same thing and we get all worked up because somebody persecuted us. That's our opportunity to bear witness. Someone said, oh, this basketball team shouldn't be playing because they're trying to fall away from Jesus. We shouldn't be surprised if they say that about them. What is meant to be an opportunity to bear witness has turned to a season of fear. The disciples have had a front row seat all this time to the most important event in human history in their mighty time to the Lord. Maybe I should add, the rest of that story about the author that wrote the article about the Christian school in the basketball tournament was fired in class because they said something in the past that made somebody else mad. I don't know. That's the culture that we're in. But shouldn't uh, say things for people to take the opinion to stand for the principles of God and how you lost your job. I'm not trying to be vengeful or anything about that, but I'm not surprised by that either. The fact that someone would write an article is not a reason to be worried or afraid. It's a time to declare with boldness, I stand amazed in the presence. In Christ alone, my hope is found. I ran out of that grave. The resurrection is a reason for boldness, not for fear. Amen? Mary missed it. The disciples missed it. Probably the most famous thing is another person that misses it here in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came home. Oh, hey, Thomas. Jesus comes up out of the grave and appears to the disciples and you're not there. I feel bad for Thomas. He talked about missing it. Wrong place, wrong time. Where, where was he? What was going on for? Maybe he was out trying to find out what's going on instead of the towering behind the closed door. Maybe we should be able to correct for that. So when he comes back, verse 25, so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. Thomas said, I've been around town. He said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into the side, I will never believe you. That's a pretty bold statement there, Thomas. You've been following this guy for three days, for three years, seeing the miracles he's doing. I think Thomas still doesn't know what's going on. Thomas literally missed it. And in this moment, he speaks very boldly about he will not believe, right? And you probably know someone who's not in church today, who doesn't believe in Easter, and 
And they are very bold about, I don't believe that. They don't believe about the event for a reading day. And they may be even antagonistic towards those who say they do believe it. And the reason that people outside of the Christian faith miss out is because they're in the same situation as Thomas. They have not experienced the presence of a risen Savior. I serve a risen Savior who's in the world today, right? We sing that song. That's the reason people outside the, in the world who aren't a part of the church and aren't people of faith say, I will not believe. And the reason is because they have not experienced a risen Christ. We should not mock them for that or be surprised. We should be sorrowful that they have not yet experienced that experience. And we know in Thomas' situation, that changed, didn't it? Thomas is about to encounter a living Christ, and his beliefs will change real quick. Look at verse 26. Unfortunately, it's eight days later. Eight days later, Thomas goes saying, I'm not going to believe this. Now, probably some other things happened between there. I wish John would list that, that seven days that happened between there. But it says that eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Good on you, Thomas. You're in the right place this time. Although the doors are locked, they're still behind locked doors, though. Makes me think that we spent this last eight weeks. Jesus showed up on Sunday for this last eight days. What's going on in the last eight days? We're still behind locked doors. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, I heard what you said. Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. I would love to see the expression change on Thomas' face at this moment. He's the only one in the room who hasn't seen Jesus. It's been a week. Now Jesus shows up and says, Did I hear what you said? Here's the world. Just go ahead and touch it. I would just love to see the shock of all the embarrassment, the guilt. Whatever it is on Thomas' face, and he just falls into this, this, this complete acceptance. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, when we read Thomas' little confession here, My Lord and my God, in English, it just sounds very simple. There's a lot going on. Thomas is describing to Jesus deity. Not just my Lord, Master, Rabbi, Teacher, but my God. When he says that word there, it's one of the clearest expressions about who he thought Jesus was. It's one of the strongest statements in the New Testament about the deity of Christ. One study I wrote that I looked at in this passage suggested that either Thomas is proclaiming that Jesus is God, equal with the Father, or he is using the name of God in vain. Now think about that for the practicing Jew. Remember, they wouldn't even write the name out. They would use just the part of the word. They wouldn't say that name. And for Thomas to see the risen Jesus and take the name of God in vain seems very unrealistic and unlikely. It's unthinkable for a Jew with strong moral convictions about even saying the name of God. Thomas goes from doubting to declaring. As we come to this series, there have been a lot of people who have just missed. Most often in the Gospel of John, the disciples frequently didn't understand, but Peter, probably most of all, at the Last Supper, the oh, Lord will not wash my feet, and all of a sudden he says, well, wash my head and my hands as well. And they go to the garden and he's praying. Peter's got his sword out. He's chopping ears. Missing point, Jesus heals him. Yet when the time comes for Easter, who's the first one to go into the empty tomb? Peter. John is starting to redeem what he said about Peter in the past. He's called him out by name and said, there was some foolishness on Peter's part. But when the grave was empty, Peter was the first one in. There's nothing more important to catch than this. Not only was Peter in the team, but we all had that opportunity. But there's still another person who was there at the resurrection. The 
the one who ran ahead of Peter to the tomb and didn't go in, the one whose word we've been reading this entire time. And he wants to prevent us from missing it like he did. He calls himself in verse 2, the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and called the author. And six, that's what John the Jews is called, called the author, not the list of his own name. And as he had on so many other occasions in the book in verse 9, John told us that once again that the disciples did not understand it. And this changes dramatically in about 40 days when the Holy Spirit comes. And it's not only that they don't understand, they're explaining things to everybody else. And the Holy Spirit empowers and energizes the disciples and the believers. There was a lot of things they just missed in the book You guys, are there any baseball fans in here? Me neither. This is baseball. There is. Baseball season started this week. They decided, you know, opening day is a big deal. I think the Reds get to go first. But, um, you know, supposedly they're going to play all their games this year. And I'm not a big fan of something that occurred to me. I have heard it said before that hitting a home run in baseball is the hardest thing to do in sports. Now, as a not baseball fan and basketball fan, I started looking at this. I was thinking about that. You have a round object that is about five ounces in weight and less than three inches in diameter. And what happens is an athletic person who has trained their entire life to take this thing and throw it as hard as they can is going to throw it towards you. Hard as fast as they can. They can make it spin, you know, they hold it certain ways. Um, if you've ever been close enough to a baseball game or close enough to somebody who can throw a baseball hard, you can hear it coming. You don't need to see it. And they can spin it and throw it that fast. You can hear it coming. So the person that's going to throw this, who's trained their entire life to do this, can do it at up, upwards of 100 miles an hour. I can't do that. But they're going to stand 60 feet and 6 inches away and throw this at you 100 miles an hour. And it can leave the pitcher's hand across the plate in less than half a second. Your goal is to hit this object. Moving at 100 miles an hour in all different directions, spinning. You've been thrown by a man who's trained to do this his entire life. The object that you're holding is a bat that's only two and a half inches in diameter. It's round. It's not like you get a two by four and stand up there with you know, four inches wide, six inches wide and try to hit it. And you, you, you get at least three chances, though. That's the good news. You're going to throw it in an imaginary box over the plate somewhere between your armpits and your knees. And that's all the information you have to go on. From here to here, about that wide, at 100 miles an hour, you can try to hit it with a round object. They play 162 games in the baseball season. And a batter may get a chance to bat anywhere from three to five times in a game. Maybe more if they're successful at it. So long as Success in hitting a baseball is measured in a fraction of an inch. Where's that bat at? In the middle of seconds of time, because it's coming at 100 miles an hour. To make the bat hit the ball squarely is an amazing amount of hand eye coordination and skill and practice. Swinging just a millisecond early or a millisecond late can be the difference between success and failure. If you ever watch the baseball game, there's a lot of times where they just get part of it and goes flying off and not play a full foul ball. In 2019, a professional baseball player went to bat 54 straight times without getting hit. This was a professional. Really good players managed to hit it and keep it in play and get on base only three or four times in 10 chances. Really good players. If you can hit it four times out of 10 and get on base, you're probably one of the best there's ever been. Statistics tell us that one out of those six times will be a home run. 
So they're only hitting it three or four times out of ten, and only every six times they do one out of every six times is a home run. And every year, lots of fans, not me, pay a lot of money to see people who are really good at both pitching and really good at hitting try to do it and see who does it better. Many games, players don't get a hit. If a pitcher is successful, 27 times in a row is called a no hitter. Nobody got on base. It happens occasionally. Sometimes it seems to me. Here's my point today. When the Apostle John has his chance at the plate, and his chance to swing, he wants it to be a home run. So what he writes here at the end is to make sure that we don't miss what he's trying to say. In verse 30, not chapter 20. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, here they don't want you to miss. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in His name. Now we know in the story that eventually Mary and the disciples and Thomas all realize what they had missed. And eventually they get a hit to figure it out. Today is the opportunity to hit the home run, but this is what John is pitching. John, who is an eyewitness to the event, says in chapter 21, verse 24, I was there, I was an eyewitness, I wrote these things, and they are true. If I told you everything that he did, the world could not contain all the books that would be written. John throwing softballs in there now. He's got the ball that's this big. You can hit it with whatever you want. He says, don't miss this. I was there. This is the truth. Hit it out of the park. He said, I have written so that you may believe and that you may have life in his name. Easter is about life. About resurrected life. About hope. And that's the worship team to come back with and sing. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. This is your chance to declare, to openly proclaim, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's the congregation of the family as well. If you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, if you're out there listening to our video or in this room, if you do not think the blood is the payment for your sin, today is the day. Easter is a great day for you to begin a new life. If that's your desire today, I invite you to come to these altars on both sides. Someone will meet you here and help you.
death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And he said, write this down for these words.